Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight, we have some of the romances of Trig Eagle, as collected and edited by Robert Hunt. These stories appear in Popular Romances of the West of England, or The Drolls, Traditions, and Superstitions of Old Cornwall, published in 1865. This is a bit of an unusual format for the channel. There are many, many, many legends of the demon Trigigal from all over Cornwall, with many different aspects and variations. Hunt presents these, along with various facts and commentary, in a very interesting way, so we get several of these stories as told by different people from different perspectives, rather than a single, linear narrative. If you read the text in the book, you will also note that Trigigal is spelled and pronounced differently at different times. I'm going to call it Trigigal throughout. Final note before we begin that laying a ghost means basically returning the spirit to rest in the afterlife so it doesn't continue to wander the earth. Now, let's open our imaginations and begin. In Cornwall's fair land, by the pool on the moor, Trigigal the wicked did dwell. Who has not heard of the wild spirit Trigigal? He haunts equally the moor, the rocky coasts, and the blown sand hills of Cornwall. From north to south, from east to west, this doomed spirit is heard of, and to the day of judgment he is doomed to wander, pursued by avenging fiends. Forever endeavoring to perform some task by which he hopes to secure repose, and being forever defeated. Who has not heard the howling of Trigigal? When the storms come with all their strength from the Atlantic and urge themselves upon the rocks around the land's end, the howls of the spirit are louder than the roaring of the winds. When calms rest upon the ocean and the waves can scarcely form upon the resting waters, low wailings creep along the coast. These are the wailings of this wandering soul. When midnight is on the moor or on the mountains, and the night winds whistle amidst the rugged cairns, the shrieks of Trigigal are distinctly heard. We know, then, that he is pursued by the demon dogs, and that till daybreak he must fly with all speed before them. The voice of Trigigal is everywhere, and yet he is unseen by human eye. Every reader will at once perceive that Trigigal belongs to the mythologies of the oldest nations, and that the traditions of this wandering spirit in Cornwall, which center upon one tyrannical magistrate, are but the appropriation of stories which belong to every age and every country. Tradition thus tells Trigigal's tale. There are some men who appear to be from their births given over to the will of tormenting demons. Such a man was Trigigal. He is as old as the hills, yet there are many circumstances in the story of his life which appear to remove him from this remote antiquity. Modern legends assert him to belong to comparatively modern times and say that, without doubt, he was one of the Trigigals who once owned Trevorder near Bodmin. We have not, however, much occasion to trouble ourselves with the man or his life. It is with the death and the subsequent existence of a myth that we are concerned. Certain it is that the man Trigigal was diabolically wicked. He seems to have been urged on from one crime to another until the cup of sin was overflowing. Trigigal was wealthy beyond most men of his time, and his wealth purchased for him that immunity which the church, in her degenerate days, too often accorded to those who could aid, with their gold or power, the sensual priesthood. As a magistrate, he was tyrannical and unjust, and many an innocent man was wantonly sacrificed by him for the purpose of hiding his own dark deeds. As a landlord, he was rapacious and unscrupulous, and frequently so involved his tenants in his toils that they could not escape his grasp. The stain of secret murder clings to his memory, and he is said to have sacrificed a sister whose goodness stood between him and his demon passions. His wife and children perished victims to his cruelties. At length, death drew near to relieve the land of a monster whose name was a terror to all who heard it. 
Devils waited to secure the soul they had won, and Tregeagle, in terror, gave to the priesthood wealth that they might fight with them and save his soul from eternal fire. Desperate was the struggle, but the powerful exorcisms of the bandit brotherhood of a neighboring monastery drove back the evil ones, and Tregeagle slept with his fathers, safe in the custody of the churchmen who buried him with high honors in St. Brioch Church. They sang chants and read prayers above his grave to secure the soul which they thought they had saved. But Tregeagle was not fated to rest. Satan desired still to gain possession of such a gigantic sinner, and we can only refer what ensued to the influence of the wicked spiritings of his ministers. A dispute arose between two wealthy families respecting the ownership of extensive lands around Bodmin. The question had been rendered more difficult by the nefarious conduct of Tregeagle, who had acted as a steward to one of the claimants, and who had destroyed ancient deeds, forged others, and indeed made it appear that he was the real proprietor of the domain. Large portions of the land Tregeagle had sold, and other parts were leased upon long terms, he having received all the money and appropriated it. His death led to inquiries, and then the transactions were gradually brought to light. Involving, as this did, large sums of money, and indeed it was a question upon which turned the future well-doing or ruin of a family, it was fought by the lawyers with great pertinacity. The legal questions had been argued several times before the judges at the assizes. The trials had been deferred, new trials had been sought for and granted, and every possible plan known to the lawyers for postponing the settlement of a suit had been tried. A day was at length fixed, upon which a final decision must be come to, and a special jury was sworn to administer justice between the contending parties. Witnesses innumerable were examined as to the validity of a certain deed, and the balance of evidence was equally suspended. The judge was about to sum up the case and refer the question to the jury when the defendant in the case, coming into court, proclaimed aloud that he had yet another witness to produce. There was a strange silence in the judgment hall. It was felt that something chilling to the soul was amongst them, and there was a simultaneous throb of terror as Tregeagle was led into the witness box. When the awestruck assembly had recovered, the lawyers for the defendant commenced their examination, which was long and terrible. The result, however, was the disclosure of an involved system of fraud of which the honest defendant had been the victim, and the jury unhesitatingly gave a verdict in his favor. The trial over, everyone expected to see the specter witness removed. There, however, he stood, powerless to fly, although he evidently desired to do so. Spirits of darkness were waiting to bear him away, but some spell of holiness prevented them from touching him. There was a struggle with the good and the evil angels for this sinner's soul, and the assembled court appeared frozen with horror. At length, the judge with dignity commanded the defendant to remove his witness. To bring him from the grave has been to me so dreadful a task that I leave him to your care and that of the priors by whom he was so beloved. Having said this, the defendant left the court. The churchmen were called in, and long were the deliberations between them and the lawyers as to the best mode of disposing of Tregeagle. They could resign him to the devil at once, but, by long trial, the worst of his crimes might be absolved, and, as good churchmen, they could not sacrifice a human soul. The only thing was to give the spirit some task, difficult beyond the power of human nature, which might be extended far into eternity. Time might thus gradually soften the obdurate soul which still retained all the black dyes of the sins done in the flesh, that by infinitely slow degrees repentance might exert its softening power. The spell therefore put upon Trigigo was that as long as he was employed on some endless assigned task, there should be hope of salvation, and that he should be secure from the assaults of the devil as long as he labored steadily. A moment's rest was fatal, labor unresting, and forever was his doom. 
One of the lawyers, remembering that Dosmary Pool was bottomless, and that a thorn bush which had been flung into it but a few weeks before had made its appearance in Falmouth Harbour, proposed that Tree Eagle might be employed to empty this profound lake. Then, one of the churchmen, to make the task yet more enduring, proposed that it should be performed by the aid of a limpet shell having a hole in it. This was agreed to, and the required incantations were duly made. Bound by mystical spells, Tregeagle was removed to the dark moors and duly set to work. Year after year passed by, and there, day and night, summer and winter, storm and shine, Tregeagle was bending over the dark water, working hard with his perforated shell, yet the pool remained at the same level. His old enemy, the devil, kept a careful eye on the doomed one, resolving, if possible, to secure so choice an example of evil. Often did he raise tempests sufficiently wild, as he supposed, to drive Tregeagle from his work, knowing that if he failed for a season to labor, he could seize and secure him. These were long tried in vain, but at length an auspicious hour presented itself. Nature was at war with herself. The elements had lost their balance, and there was a terrific struggle to recover it. Lightnings flashed and coiled like fiery snakes around the rocks of Rockter. Fireballs fell on the desert moors and hissed in the accursed lake. Thunders pealed through the heavens and echoed from hill to hill. An earthquake shook the solid earth, and terror was on all living. The winds arose and raged with a fury which was irresistible, and hail beat so mercilessly on all things that it spread death around. Long did Tregeagle stand the pelting of the pitiless storm, but at length he yielded to its force and fled. The demons in crowds were at his heels. He doubled, however, on his pursuers and returned to the lake, but so rapid were they that he could not rest the required moment to dip his shell in the now seething waters. Three times he fled round the lake, and the evil ones pursued him. Then, feeling that there was no safety for him near Dosnery Pool, he sprang swifter than the wind across it, shrieking with agony, and thus, since the devils cannot cross water and were obliged to go round the lake, he gained on them and fled over the moor. Away! Away went Tregeagle, faster and faster the dark spirits pursuing, and they had nearly overtaken him when he saw Roach Rock and its chapel before him. He rushed up the rocks with giant power, clambered to the eastern window, and dashed his head through it, thus securing the shelter of its sanctity. The defeated demons retired, and long and loud were their wild wailings in the air. The inhabitants of the moors and of the neighboring town slept not a wink that night. Tregeagle was safe. His head was within the holy church, though his body was exposed on a bare rock to the storm. Earnest were the prayers of the blessed hermit in his cell on the rock to be relieved from his nocturnal and sinful visitor. In vain were the recluse's prayers. Day after day, as he knelt at the altar, the ghastly head of the doomed sinner grinned horridly down at him. Every holy ejaculation fell upon Tregeagle's ear like molten iron. He writhed and shrieked under the torture, but legions of devils filled the air ready to seize him if for a moment he withdrew his head from the sanctuary. Sabbath after Sabbath, the little chapel on the rock was rendered a scene of sad confusion by the interruptions which Tregeagle caused. Men trembled with fear at his agonizing cries, and women swooned. At length the place was deserted, and even the saint of the rock was wasting to death by the constant perturbation in which he was kept by the unholy spirit and the demons who, like carrion birds, swarmed around the holy cairn. Things could not go on thus. The monks of Bodmin and the priests from the neighboring churches gathered together, and the result of their long and anxious deliberations was that Tregeagle, guarded by two saints, should be taken to the north coast near Padstow and employed in making trusses of sand and ropes of sand with which to bind them. By powerful spell, Tregeagle was removed from Roach and fixed upon the sandy shores of the Padstow district. Sinners are seldom permitted to enjoy any peace of soul. As the ball of sand grew into form, the tides rose and the breaker spread out the sands again a level sheet. 
Again was it packed together and again washed away. Toil, 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 day and night unrestingly. Sand on sand grew with each hour, and ruthlessly the ball was swept by one blow of a sea wave along the shore. The cries of Tregeagle were dreadful, and as the destruction of the sand heap was constantly recurring, a constantly increasing despair gained the mastery over hope, and the ravings of the baffled soul were louder than the roarings of the winter tempest. Baffled in making trusses of sand, Tregeagle seized upon the loose particles and began to spin them into a rope. Long and patiently did he pursue his task, and hope once more rose like a star out of the midnight darkness of despair. A rope was forming, when a storm came up with all its fury from the Atlantic, and swept the particles of sand away over the hills. The inhabitants of Padstow had seldom any rest. At every tide the bowlings of Tregeagle banished sleep from each eye. But now so fearful were the sounds of the doomed soul in the madness of the struggle between hope and despair that the people fled the town and clustered upon the neighboring plains, praying, as with one voice, to be relieved from the sad presence of this monster. St. Petrock, moved by the tears and petitions of the people, resolved to remove the spirit, and, by the intense earnestness of his prayers, after long wrestling, he subdued Tregeagle to his will. Having chained him with the bonds which the saints had forged with his own hands, every link of which had been welded with a prayer, St. Petrock led the spirit away from the north coast and stealthily placed him on the southern shores. In those days, Ella's town, now Helston, was a flourishing port. Ships sailed into the estuary, up into the town, and they brought all sorts of merchandise and returned with cargoes of tin from the mines of Breage and Wendron. The wily monk placed his charge at Bareppa, and there condemned him to carry sacks of sand across the estuary of the Lou and to empty them at Porthleven until the beach was clean down to the rocks. The priest was a good observer. He knew that the sweep of the tide was from Truava's head round the coast toward the lizard, and that the sand would be carried back steadily and speedily, as fast as the spirit could remove it. Long did Tregeagle labor and, of course, in vain. His struggles were giant-like to perform his task, but he saw the sands return as regularly as he removed them. The sufferings of the poor fishermen who inhabited the coast around Porthleven were great. As the howlings of Tregeagle disturbed the dwellers in Padstow, so did they now distress these toil-worn men. When sorrow is highest, relief is nighest, and a mischievous demon-watcher in pure wantonness brought that relief to those fishers of the sea. Tregeagle was laden with a sack of sand of enormous size and was wading across the mouth of the estuary when one of those wicked devils who were kept ever near Tregeagle in very idleness tripped up the heavily laden spirit. The sea was raging with the irritation of a passing storm, and, as Tregeagle fell, the sack was seized by the waves, and its content poured out across this arm of the sea. There, to this day, it rests, a bar of sand, fatally destroying the harbor of Ellistown. The rage of the inhabitants of this seaport, now destroyed, was great, and with all their priests away they went to the Lou Bar and assailed their destroyer. Against human anger, Tregeagle was proof. The shock of tongues fell harmlessly on his ear, and the assault of human weapons was unavailing. By the aid of the priests and faith-inspired prayers, the bonds were once more placed upon Tregeagle, and he was, by the force of bell, book, and candle, sent to the land's end. There he would find no harbor to destroy, and but few people to terrify. His task was to sweep the sands from Porth Curnow Cove round the headland called Toy Peed and Penwith into Nangisal Cove. Those who know that rugged headland with its cubical masses of granite piled in titanic grandeur one upon another will appreciate the task, and, when to all the difficulties are added the strong sweep of the Atlantic current, that portion of the Gulf Stream which washes our southern shores, it will be evident that the melancholy spirit has, indeed, a task which must endure until the world shall end. Even until today is Tregeagle laboring at his task. 
in calms his wailing is heard, and those sounds which some call the sighing of the wind are known to be the moanings of Tregeagle, while the coming storms are predicated by the fearful roarings of this condemned mortal. John Tregeagle the Steward there are numerous versions of this legend, and sundry statements made as to the man who is supposed to have achieved the no very envious immortality which he enjoys. One or two of these may interest the reader. The following very characteristic narrative, from a much-esteemed correspondent, gives several incidents which have not a place in the legend as I have related it, which comprehends the explanation given for the appearance of Tregeagle at so many different parts of the county. The Tregeagle, of whom mention occurs in the writings of Cornish legendary authors, was a real person, a member of a respectable family, resident during the 17th century at Trevorder in the parish of St. Brioch, and identical, probably, with a John Tregeagle, whose tombstone may yet be seen in the parish church there, close to the chancel. Lingering one day amid the venerable arches of that same church, the narrator, a native of the parish, encountered, near a small transept called the Trevorder Isle, the sexton, a man then perhaps about eighty years of age. The conversation turning not unnaturally on the illustrious dead, the narrator was gratified in receiving from the lips of the old man the following characteristic specimen of folklore, the greater part of which has remained clearly imprinted on his memory after a lapse of many years, though he thinks he has had to supply the very last sentence of all from the general popular tradition, and here and there he may have had to supply a few expressions. This John Tergeagle, I've a heard man tell, sir, he was a steward to a lord. And a man came for to the court and paid us rent, and John Tergeagle didn't put no cross as to his name in the books. And after that Tergeagle died, and the lord came down to look after his rents, and when he seed the books he seed this man's name that there wa'n't no cross to it. And he sent for the man, and he asked for his rent, and the man said he'd a pay it his rent. And the Lord said he hadn't, there weren't no cross as to his name in the books, and he told him that he'd have the law for him if he didn't pay. And the man, he didn't know what to do. He went for to the minister of Simon Ward, if and the minister asked if he'd a got faith, and the man, he hadn't got faith, and he was obliged for to go homewards again. And after that the Zyasis were coming nigh, and he was becoming a feared pure enough, and he went for to the minister again, and told him he'd got faith, and the minister might do whatever he liked. And the minister drayed a ring out on the floor, and he called out three times, John Tergeagle, John Tergeagle, John Tergeagle. And I've heard the old man tell it, sir. This John Tergeagle stood before him in the middle of the ring. And he went forward man to the assizes, and gave us evidence, and told how this man had a pay this rent, and the Lord he was cast. And after that he was come back to their own house, and these John Tergeagle gave him on a brave deal of trouble. He was knacking about the place, and wouldn't leave man alone at all. And they went forward to the minister, and asked he for to lay in. And the minister said, Dickie was there lick out, there rotten up, and they was getting and down again the best way they could. And I've heard the old man tell it, sir, the minister, he got three hundred pound for the laying of him again. And first, he was bound to the old Eppenstock up to Churchtown. Fin after that, he was bound to the old oven in Treverder. And James White down to Wade Bridge, he was there when they did open it. And after that, he was bound to Dosemary Pool. And they do say that there he is now, emptying of it out with a limpet shell, with a hole in the bottom of it. The best sentence in this story is, To bring him from the grave has been to me so dreadful a task that I leave him to your care and that of the priors by whom he was so beloved. This is, of course, a reference to the fact that the priest secured for him a church burial in return for his ill-gotten money, and so now they can deal with his ghost. What a cool set of stories. This really is my favorite kind of content where real places and practices and people are mingled with myths and legends and origin stories. So the whole world becomes infused with mystery and magic. And there are more crazy legends of Tree Giggle. So we could do a part two if you guys are interested. 
So yes, Don Tregeagle is a kind of a Cornish version of Faust. He's a man who achieved, you know, wealth and power through evil acts, and some say by making a deal with the devil. And after he died, he was summoned back to life to testify to something or another, but then he wasn't sent back to hell, either because he wouldn't go or because people had some kind of compassion on him. So he was sentenced instead to an eternity of doing impossible tasks on earth, which he is still doing today. And he was, as they've mentioned, a real person, an official who lived in Cornwall in the early 17th century, although the specific biographical details of his life are different in different sources. As Hunt says in this story, his life isn't very important, right? It's his afterlife that matters. And I do love how Hunt's telling here takes us all over the map, from place to place and legend to legend. Many of the places mentioned in this story were already places of legend and lore, even outside of their associations with Trick Eagle. And I think that's the genius of this myth. Someone somewhere in Cornwall came up with the story of this howling demon ghost a uh, sentence to an eternity of impossible tasks, forever being pursued by the hounds of hell, and everyone proceeded to adopt it and adapt it to their own community and their own ecosystem. Oh, we have a spooky spot in our town, and we hear scary sounds at night, and I can think of an impossible task. So this trigigal is also haunting our moors and beaches and mountains and whatnot. Everyone just took a piece of that story and made it their own, which is why there are so many versions and variations. I think it is delightful. And it is also, for me, just a really lovely way to learn more about the very specific geography of Cornwall. Following him around on the map was really interesting and very instructive. Hunt does present in this book a few more Trigiga legends, and as I mentioned, I'd be happy to record some more if you guys want. Um, by themselves, without the origin stories that are mentioned in these stories, uh, the rest of them don't make that much sense, and they're not as interesting. But having all of them at once would have made for a pretty long video. Speaking of long videos, if you listen all the way to the end, you get to hear me make a little confession. Tonight's confession is that in a recent confession, I mentioned I was waiting to achieve 1,000 subscribers and to get the deposit back on the apartment I moved out of seven months ago. And behold, both of those things have been accomplished. My old landlord was remarkably agreeable and compliant with my lawyer, which kind of makes me mad he was such a jerk to me. You know, up until now, I've always been a renter, and I have rented from literally dozens of landlords in my life, and I have never had the struggle that I have had since I've been living in Europe. And it's interesting because renters in Europe have many more legal rights and protections than renters in America, and yet every single landlord I have had here has tried to scam me in some way or another, and it's always been a fight. And I don't think it's that landlords in Budapest or Amsterdam or whatever are more prone to scamming tenants than landlords in the U.S. I think it's that if we are communicating in English and they know I'm a foreigner, they assume they can scam me. Also, every time I've argued or pushed back about it, they have said, five of them now, in three different countries, you don't know how it works here. And I'm always like, yeah, but I know how math works. I think landlords in the U.S. probably do the exact same thing to immigrants and expats. I just didn't know about it before. And to be fair, I think a lot of the time they aren't directly trying to scam me. I think they're trying to scam the government to evade taxes or whatever. And they're kind of using their tenants and their contracts and their rental agreements to that end. But yeah, in the Netherlands, this guy was for sure trying to scam me. But... That chapter of my life is mercifully over for a while, and I am very happy to turn the page. If you like turning pages, subscribe to the channel. Every week I find old, interesting stories and I share them with you, and you really wouldn't want to miss anything. Please also go ahead and like this video, or drop me a comment, or even share it if you think you know someone who would like it. It really does help the channel grow. Thank you so much for all your support, and I will see you in a few days.